everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown, and this is this week's Hangout. Um, got a number of folks here in the chat room. Let me go back and check. Uh, Christine's here, Annie's here, Lisa S is here, Molly's here. Uh, come, I can't quite see up further, and I know people are more people are going to be coming in in a second. So anyway, welcome guys. Um, and if you want to be in this chat room and you're like, why can't I get in? I saw live listed on this Hangout. Well, it's for pa patrons only of Patreon. There's a link below uh, and you can join that and you can then join all my live shows, um, the, the, case, the case shows, uh, the hangouts and now the phone ins. So anyway, hi. Oh, Amanda's here. Woo, woo, woo. I have to say this because Amanda is new. <laughs> oh my God, Amanda's saying, I'm excited to be able to say sound and video is good. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I forgot to ask. <laughs> and welcome, Amanda, because this is your your first hangout. It's great to have you here. Oh my gosh. Uh, I, I like the, I like new people coming because I know they have uh, lots to um, add to the, the group here and we have a great group. So anyway, so you can see and hear me. That is good. And um, let me see what I'm trying to see what else we have. Oh, this one's a good quality view. <laughs> I hope I'll have the slightly blurry one because then I look better. You know, um, <laughs> you know, when, when the when TVs got better, you know, once upon a time, TVs, TVs were very blurry and the actors and actresses really liked that because, you know, if they had wrinkles on their faces or whatever, that blurriness of the TV just covered it up. And then they started getting these super high quality HD TVs and everybody went to a panic. And that's why you see so many people with Botox and, and doing all kinds of things to their skin and getting faceless because their faces don't look as good anymore. <laughs> So I just have to control this by making it really blurry. So I look better. So <laughs> and everybody is welcoming Amanda. Yay. Okay. Now, okay. What do I want to talk about? Mm, well, I obviously have to start with just a little um, statement on, um, oh, before I keep going on that, do just like this video, uh, join the channel by subscribing to it, um, share with people, hit the bell to get um, notification. And if you notice that little dollar sign under my videos now that is super thanks finally there is a way without being during a live show where people can give a donation a one-time donation just by clicking on that little button below the video and if if you see a video without it it's because i just put it up to, to the public and it takes a while to process a few hours before the dollar sign will ever show up but all my other videos have it now so one more way to try to keep this channel going considering I'm demonetized so much. So, any rate, let's go to my first topic of the day, which is going to be Madeleine McCann, uh, just because I have to, um, the 15th year anniversary. And if you haven't seen the, the video I just did on it, um, I was invited on to you know, UK television to do a show, um, the Colin Frazier show. Is that his name? Brazier, sorry, not Frazier. Colin Brazier show. Um, and... They called me for the pre-interview and I told them what I thought and they said, oh, we can't have you on <laughs> because I wasn't following the agenda, which was to say that the, you know, the disappearance of Madeleine McCann was by way of an abductor and that Christian Bruckner, the guy they've got there in Germany, is a darn fine suspect and we're pretty sure he did it. All right. So that's funny. You, you, you can go see that video. Um, but what I want to talk about is the fibers because they just talked about, hi Florence, Florence is here too, um, the fibers in the car. Now they're saying, that not his van. Now, if you don't know who Christian Bruckner is, he's, uh, he's already in prison in Germany for other crimes. Um, he's kind of a creepy, crappy dude. Um, and he lived in Prior de Luge at the time that Madeleine McCann went missing 15 years ago. And now he's being touted as the guy who did it. Um, there's been no physical evidence at all. There's no witnesses to him taking her. There's just nothing. But we just see in probably one of the finer publications in the UK, like maybe The Sun, um, <clears throat> uh, that there's been fibers found in his van. And they're not, the Germans aren't, you know, like saying this is true. They're just not, not quite, not properly responding, shall we say. We can't, uh, we're not going to deny it, but we're not going to say it. So, um, fiber is supposedly from the outfit that Madeline was wearing when she went missing. <laughs> and I'm just like, 
Well, one, I didn't know they had fibers, you know, in evidence of the exact thing she went missing in, like they had fibers from that outfit. But okay, let's assume they actually had some fibers, I don't know, maybe left in the bed, you know, from that outfit, um, her pajamas. Um, but now, apparently, there are fibers that match those fibers. And they're still in his van 15 years later. I mean, I know he's a scumbag and probably doesn't clean his van, but still, that's 15 years, you know? Um, first of all, we don't know that those fibers, even if they match, couldn't match a hundred other cloths as well, you know, because it's not, there's not just one fiber in an outfit. It does match other fibers and other, other clothing or whatever. Um, but I'm just thinking, this dude used the back of his van for parties, drugs, um, carrying a whole bunch of stuff, having sex with I don't know how many women over 15 years, and who else. I'm going to say you could take the fibers in the back of his van and you could weave a rug out of them. Sudden great news that there's physical evidence linking him to the abduction of Madeleine McCann. No, no, it's all nonsense. It's just just some more silliness that's out there. Um, and so, you know, people really, you know, it's frustrating because when people read the different news, you know, they'll suddenly go, oh my God, but, but did you, did you hear this today? I'm like, yeah, I heard that today. And it's still meaningless because it's very hard to determine between something that has value as far as evidence, especially when it comes from the media and something that has no value at all. So, and who to believe, because once they start not telling the truth and that German prosecutor, let me say, he hasn't really been good at telling the truth. So. I don't believe him because I don't trust him. I've already seen him be sketchy. So, you know, and my opinion is if you work for the public, you shouldn't be lying to the public. So, you know, so I would take that information. Just put that aside. All right. The second thing I want to talk about is, is the Jean Bonnet case, because this is what has happened. And this just came out. The father of Jean Bonnet Ramsey is supporting an online petition asking Colorado's governor to intervene in the investigation into her death more than 25 years ago by putting an outside agency in charge of DNA testing on the case. Okay. And in case you just don't know anything about Jean Bonnet, uh, the six-year-old was found dead in the basement of her family's home in Boulder, Colorado, December 26, 1996, bludgeoned and strangled several hours after her mother called 911 to say her daughter was missing and a ransom note had been left behind. Her death was ruled a homicide, but nobody was ever prosecuted. Uh, and I have, a, I have a video on the Jean Bonnet case, so just go to my playlist and look for that case, Jean Bonnet Ramsey. Um, there has never been evidence in that case either of an outsider being in the home at all. Um, so the focus quite frankly, has been for many detectives on the Ramseys themselves. And there were only three other people in the home of Jean Bonnet. That was her brother and her mother and father. Uh, the, the ransom note has always been suspicious as having been written by one of the, one of the parents or by both of the parents. And so consequently, the case has gone on. So Patsy Ramsey has died of cancer since. So now we just have the, the, the boy who uh, grew up and ended up on a television show and they kind of made it sound like he was the killer. So he, he sued him for a whole lot of money and won. And uh, then there's John Ramsey who doggedly says, you know, the family had nothing to do with it. Okay. Now, there once was a little bit of DNA found in this case and it was on some panties that Jean Bonnet was wearing that weren't even her really her size. And it was touch DNA. And here's where we get into this tricky little area of what evidence do we believe and what don't we believe? Now, touch DNA is such minor, minor DNA that it can just literally be transferred by somebody touching a skin cell phone, you know, just tiny thing. It's not semen. So there's not evidence of somebody who raped the person. It's not blood. Like you had a, you know, you stabbed the person and they stabbed you and you got some cuts on your hand while you were trying to kill them. And then your blood went on them. Great DNA. And that proves you probably were there because your blood is on them. All right. So semen DNA, blood DNA are two very good me methods of connecting somebody to a crime. Unless the semen sometimes can be screwy because sometimes a woman will Let's say have a little 
you know, romance with somebody, come home and then get raped by a guy who uses a condom. And then that DNA won't match the rapist, it'll match the guy she had sex with, who will probably never come forward because <laughs> he thinks he's going to be charged with murder. And he might be right. So touch DNA, however, is easily transferred. And there's cases where, uh, I, I mentioned this case the other week, where what happened was they came up with DNA at the scene for this guy. Uh, but what happened was the guy had was actually in the hospital at the time that that um, homicide occurred, like he's in the ICU, <laughs> so he wasn't going any place to kill anybody. But the same ambulance people have been at both scenes and apparently had you touched his DNA was touched DNA brought to the crime scene. So that's how easy it transfers. So now we had this touch DNA in the Jean Bonnet case, and the question was, did it come from the factory the panties were made at? Did it come from somebody doing laundry? Did it come from, you know, who knows, children playing around and one of the kids touched her, you know, as kids do when they tumble. It never was identified as anybody. Um, so now John Ramsey is going along with this online petition, which, you know, part of the um, social media, you know, or somebody's got a bee up their bonnet and... And there's people out there who very strongly believe that, that the Ramses had nothing to do with what happened to their daughter. They believe, and they've got all kinds of suspects, which um, they pull out of every hat you can imagine, uh, that, and all kinds of strange scenarios. But they're going to try to, they believe that one of these people did it. And they have the right to believe that. And they think that they could get this DNA tested, whatever DNA they think is out there, and it matches one of these people, then they can, they can you know, the case can be solved. And, but the people who think that the Ramseys are involved would then wonder why would John Ramsey go, why would John Ramsey jump on board with this, you know, if he was innocent, if he was guilty or any of his family was guilty. You wonder, don't you? So two possibilities. All right. I'm going to allow the possibility. John Ramsey's family, the Ramseys had nothing to do with what happened to their daughter. They did some super strange behaviors and. A ransom note was left that looked like it was written by one of them or both of them. So, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll let that go. Do the DNA. And he could be, if it's true that he wants his DNA because they're not, the family's not involved, then the DNA may have some lucky thing and prove something. Okay, having said that, what would it prove? Now, again, we don't have any blood from a, a suspect. We don't have any semen from a suspect. What DNA are they actually testing for? More touch DNA? That's my guess. Because he's claiming, oh, they didn't, let's see what he says. He says that he wants DNA evidence that was never tested before to be transferred away from the Boulder police to a different agency. Somehow we've got to force the police or take it away from them. The ability to go ahead and test some of the crime scene evidence that was never tested for DNA. Why that's never been done and, and will never be done by the police baffles me. Well, there's got to be some reasons why you're testing certain things. You know, there, you can't test every every single item in the house because somebody might have, I don't know, touched on, touched it, drooled it, <laughs> drooled on it. I mean, why are you testing it? So now, so they test, and most likely for touch DNA. Now here's the three possibilities. Let me give them to you. One, it's one of the Ramsey's DNA. So what would that mean? Absolutely nothing. They're in the house, right? There are people that are in the house. If they're in the house, it's very easy that they're, it's, it's going to be, their touch DNA is going to be meaningless. So John Ramsey, even if his family is involved, has nothing to fear because it's, everybody's going to say, well, of course the Ramsey's DNA is going to be there. So he's taking zero risks, even if the family's guilty. So keep that in mind. The other two possibilities are this. All right, this is what the other two possibilities are. I'm moving my mic over just in case. Um, the next possibility is that the DNA is some weird touch DNA from a store, from some anybody out there and, 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 and you know, anywhere. And a factory, uh, delivery person, friend, a kid, a kid that played with them. Okay, so they come back, let's say they come back with five different DNA profiles. And one of them matches a guy from the pizza place. Well, that pizza dude, 
hopefully he's got a he's got an alibi you know what i mean so that he's not going to be dragged into this and and, and, and accused of, of killing jean bonnet um uh or if it's somebody that you know a, a, a kid one of the kids probably he didn't you know obviously like some six-year-old didn't kill jean bonnet so therefore that would be meaningless but what gets really tricky is at what point is the DNA going to have meaning? So if it's somebody in their circle, I know that a lot of people with these suspects that are, oh, they, they work for the Ramses or they were their, their friends and their whatever, Santa Claus, whatever they're claiming there, did it. Um, if he happened to be at the gathering and his touch DNA got on, on Jean Bonnet and then she's, if they find it in the house, the accusations can come flying again without any other true evidence that that person was even in the house. So that gets really questionable. Hi, Anne. One more person showed up. So the, the, the other possibility, and this is the one, only one to me that I would go, okay, I, I'm, I, I would say I could be confident on this. What would that be? Let's say a DNA showed up from a serial killer or a child pedophile who had nothing to do with the Ramses, nothing. So there's no way his DNA should be there. Zero, zip, none. He wasn't at their parties. He wasn't in their home, supposedly. He, he, he had no connection. If, a, if that person, some serial predator's DNA showed up there, then I would say, all right, I was wrong about the Ramses. This is that clearly somehow some guy got in there, left no evidence except for this touch DNA because there's no reason for his DNA to be there. But anybody connected with the, the Ramsey family, it's going to be relatively meaningless. So, but it is going to start a whole lot more finger pointing. And, and the Ramsey, John Ramsey, if he, his family is guilty of anything, has nothing to lose. Absolutely nothing whatsoever. So, uh, let me see what... Uh, um, Amanda has to say since wait a minute hold on a second um the Amanda says the only thing about the Ramses it, that I do have a hard time reconciling the parents setting up the body that way with a garrote um you know I, Amanda I think that is pretty much a problem for for everyone um is who would do that to their own child how would that happen um and and that I think frankly is probably the biggest sticking point so it's, it's one of these cases where one's looking at the evidence and can't come up with any proof that a stranger was in the house or that a stranger wrote the ransom note and can't come up any good reasons for the Ramsey's very bizarre behavior through the whole incident um, and afterwards. There's something wrong there all the way around. So that's where it gets difficult because then you say, well, everything's pointing over here because we can't come up with anybody over here. But the garage is a weird, it's a weird thing. I mean, it's a very weird thing. And was that the only thing they could think of at, after the fact that made it look like it, it would be a stranger? I mean, it, I, you know, it's hard to get into the mind of somebody in those, those moments. Um, like, you know, how would you stage something? You know, and I don't know who would have staged it or or if it was possibly par partially not staged. It was like actually something that was that occurred by somebody in the family. Now, I, I feel very strongly that Patsy Ramsey did not do anything to harm her daughter on purpose. Um, I've always felt that way. That makes no sense. So um, then it would be coming down to the other two. Um, but. It's a very tricky crime. I think it was kind of messed up in the beginning, so it's it's hard to ever prove anything with it. But I, I don't object to the DNA. I mean, if it turned out to be DNA of some serial predator, then we all say, well, you know, we might learn from this how everything can point to the family and their behaviors were unbelievable. But then again, how did the ransom note come up with so many details that were specific to the, the Ramses? In their tone? Uh, they're talking about the money he had that they knew about. I mean, you can't imagine that a, a complete stranger serial predator would have any clue of this stuff. So that doesn't, that doesn't work for me. That's why I don't believe it is. But I think that's why a lot of people believe if it's not the Ramses, it's somebody who knows them well. And, but again, they'd have to be somebody who had never had access to the house. Cause if their touch DNA is there, it's not, 
it's not going to be overly well overwhelming so I, I really don't know what they're going to accomplish with this. And my guess is nothing, but you know, it's interesting. And people have asked, you know, well, why would John go for this? Well, one reason is if you, if you know, it's not going to find anything, you always want to make, make it look like you're, you, you know, you're innocent and you're, you, you might push that forever because you want people to believe that you're innocent. you and your family is innocent. Um, and if he's not, I mean, if he didn't do anything and his family didn't do anything, well, then maybe he really does want the DNA check because he does he he has an idea that it could come up with something, and he's willing to do you know go for anything. Um, so we'll see. Uh, you know, as, as I don't get real excited about these things because I, I usually know that they don't they lead to almost nothing. Usually, yeah, it's very rare that they lead to anything. And and the claim that the the Boulder Police Department wasn't interested in doing DNA on all these things that he thinks they're not doing DNA on. I don't know if there's a legitimate thing to that at all. Um, uh, Florence said, Patsy came from a rough background in West Virginia. She made her way up life through beauty pageants. Not saying she did it, but she's tough enough to cover it up. Um, there is no, I say, there's no evidence that she did this, uh, anything to do to her daughter. She lived vicariously through her daughter. Her daughter was the one that gave her, that gave her life meaning and that she would kill her makes absolutely zero sense. Um, uh, you know, uh, but she she is tough, and she she liked her status. And if somebody else in her family committed um, a crime against that child, and she had the choice of writing them out, and then having to live with the results or covering, I think she would cover. Um, I do definitely. Um, the only way I've ever thought she could have been involved in anything that actually happened to Jean Bonnet is if she found John messing with Jean Bonnet and she tried to hit him with a heavy flashlight to knock him off of Jean Bonnet and he ducked and she hit Jean Bonnet instead. That's the only way I can put her in the scene. But you know, it's one of those things where it's hard to say. Um, and then, and then of course the son, people thought it was him because he seemed to have a rather, um, disturbed personality and, you know, young children can do some pretty bizarre things, uh, you know, and so, that's possible too and then the parents will cover up for him uh, because they don't want to lose their son as well as their daughter those kind of things but we'll see if the dna ever ever comes out to be anything <laughs> i don't think it's going to um now all right this is just a funny one i just i just i just saw this and i thought well you know you never know about these things so <laughs> i'm not going to get a, into a political discussion on uh, climate change uh, <laughs> But, but I thought it was pretty funny because, you know, climate, regardless of whether it's man-made or just is what happens in over time and, and, and on any planet, um, there, there, there was this um, area in Las Vegas where there was this drought. And so uh, Lake Mead apparently dried up. <laughs> and when it dried up, they found this, um, they, let's see what happened here. Yeah, they, they dried up and they, these they saw this barrel, <laughs> which they couldn't have found before. And there were skeletal remains in that barrel. And apparently he was killed, the guy was, the man in the barrel was killed in the 1970s or 1980s. So we're talking like 50 years ago. <laughs> Somebody chucked that barrel in the lake thinking, that'll never come up. And then the drought went, and, it, and there it was. <laughs> so, you know, you never know. Sometimes one of the ways that bodies get found is some kind of change in the landscape around them. Um, for example, a landslide can do something like this. Earthquakes can do something like this. You can have a situation where um, a housing development is brought is, is going to build and they raise all the trees and they start digging up the ground for basements for the houses and oh lo and behold there's that there's that 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 body they've been missing for the last 30 years. So I just think it's kind of interesting that you know here we have a drought and bodies are popping up. So, you know, maybe the drought will bring out even more bodies. <laughs> I just think that's quite interesting. Um, so yeah, the, the story goes that the, she and her husband were docking their boat and they heard a woman scream. And then they saw the body, which had a shirt and belt visible. The barrel appeared partially lodged in the mud. The barrel might have been visible because of Lake Mead's low water level amid a, a, an historic drought. <laughs> I just thought, how interesting, how absolutely interesting. Um, 
No, it's just a funny one. So if you're a serial killer, um, you just want to make sure you check out the, the landscape and therefore you can find a way to prevent, you know, body from being in a place that might have something happen to the landscape around it. <laughs> Very useful, <laughs> at least for 50 or 60 years until you're dead and therefore they can't get you. Um, let me see. Now here's, um, let me, let me, let me talk about funny crimes today. I mean, they're not funny, but they're, the people are, the, the people are just stupid. Let's put it that way. All right. So this one, this one just made me laugh because we're talk the other week I was talking about stupid criminals, uh, with a case in New York where the handyman killed the woman and then he chopped, he put her, he put her body in a, a like a sports bag and wheeled it down the street, leaving a blood trail behind it. And, you know, he did like everything wrong. And so the police are like on his doorstep in 24 hours and he was arrested. You know, it's like, boy, you can't, you, you can't pull off crime, you know, buddy, you can't. So this guy, this guy's really bad too. So this guy, what he did was he shot and killed somebody. Okay. And he had borrowed a family car before he went and did it, you see. So, so what happened was he shot, he shot an unidentified person in an alley. All right. And then what happened was the affidavit said the shooting, shooting was captured on the cameras. Mm -hmm. the, the video surveillance was there. And the suspect later identified as Rollins was seen driving a red convertible with black racing stripes. Okay. Clue number one, don't drive a car. That's a red convertible with black racing stripes because there's not that many of them around. So, you know, pretty much they're going to find that car, <laughs> you know, Steal a black, use a black car, like a black Honda. That's what you use for a crime. Not a red convertible with black racing stripes. Anyway, so it shows him uh, driving along and then the car stops and the driver appears to be talking to a man. The footage then showed the driver get out of the car and confront the victim. Then he's seen holding a black handgun and, and firing it multiple times and, and then dro driving away. They also had a picture, the picture of the driver wearing light colored pants and a black sweatshirt with a large white stripe across the middle. Again, black, just straight black dude, straight black. Um, video footage from the area captured a closer look at the red convertible and showed a license plate. You know, really, <laughs> you know, you want to make sure you just don't have that much video surveillance. It's got the license plate, not only the car, but the license plate. And that license plate came back to another person. The person the car belonged to called the police to say they had found the car nearby and observed what appeared to be a fired cartridge case in the passenger seat of the vehicle. Okay, dude, also don't leave evidence in the car. Um, this was just a few hours after the shooting. While being interviewed by detectives, the owners of, and uh, said the car had been loaned out to a family member and an unknown person on the day of the shooting. Uh, this, this just makes me laugh too. Who do you loan your, your car to? We'll get into that in a second. So anyway, so this was this motive behind this uh, murder was for retaliation for an earlier robbery. I'm going to say drug robbery. <laughs> I don't think the guy got robbed of, uh, I don't know, a couple books, you know, maybe somebody took his, um, hat, you know, no, I think it's a drug robbery. So, now let's, who, who is Rollins, the guy they lent the car to? The affidavit said Rollins was also listed as a registered sex offender in Texas <laughs> and was observed checking into the sex offender apprehension and registration unit, at Austin PD headquarters on April 28th. Now here again, if you got a family member who's a sex offender, do not lend them your car because they could use it for sex offenses, you see. Um, but here it gets him worse. When he signed in, the affidavit said he was wearing a similar outfit to what he was seen in the footage, the camera footage of the shooting. So now he's in the same, he's in the same outfit. <laughs> so now the car has, the, the video surveillance has the car, the license and the outfit. <laughs> and here he is in the outfit. Okay. So, um, he was also a suspect in a second shooting and let's see. Uh, Rollins have been previously arrested in 2015, 2016, but those charges haven't been released. Okay. Okay. So the dude's a, dude's a major criminal. So family, again, not only do you not loan your car to a sex offender, you don't loan your car to your criminal relative either. 
and his criminal friend, because I'm going to guess the guy who was with him probably had a long record as well. So, you know, it's, it's amazing how stupid families can be as well. Uh, it's like, oh, the guy, the guy's a sex offender. Let me move him in, into the house with my children. No, don't do that, you know, and, you know, don't do, don't, don't bring people into your life or that have, that are this volatile as far as criminality goes, because they will mess your family up and get you in trouble. I just thought that was like, really? I mean, mm -mm. now I'm going to, I want to go to a, a second, second uh, crime, which I thought was also interesting in, this is not a whodunit because it was real easy to figure out who done it, but it's just some of the issues in it. Just, um, let me see if I can find this one here. All right. This was the case. Um, the girl's, the woman's name is, it's got a bunch of issues here, which is why I wanted to bring it up. The woman's name is Taylor Pomaski. All right. And she was, she was, cause she's been found dead. Taylor. Um, uh, the mother and friend appealed to the boyfriend for answers. Okay, so I'm going to say they suspected the boyfriend like right away. Why would they suspect this boyfriend? I mean, uh, why? All right. She was 29 years old and was last seen leaving a party in North Harris County in Texas on April 25th. On May 9th, the mother filed the missing persons report after not hearing from her. All right, so she was seen leaving the party. The party took place at the home she shared with her boyfriend, ex-NFL player, Kevin Ware Jr. All right. So what happened at this party? Well, it says here. Well, here's an interesting statement leading up to the disappearance. The last time the mom spoke to her daughter was a few days before she went missing, when Pomaski called her about a macaroni and cheese recipe. I told her, I loved her and I told her that I wanted her to come home. Now, who tells their daughter to come home? Usually because a daughter is in a situation she shouldn't be in and the mother is trying to get her out of an unsafe situation. Well, the mother said that uh, even though she had moved into a new apartment in 2019 she often came home to see her mother father and her four younger siblings and she played games and they kept dinner together now here we have this problem here she described her as a free spirit i love the word free spirit uh, a free spirit can be a person who just loves to enjoy life in unique ways and 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 travel about and all this stuff but when people say free spirit they usually mean Someone who isn't really good at following the rules and keeping jobs and they're usually people getting into drugs. And so what does it say? She was fun, loving and fearless. Again, somebody who probably steps over the line in doing really stupid things. And, they, and what happened was in the spring of 2020, around the time she believed her daughter was struggling with addiction. So here we have the drugs rolling into the picture. So, an issue she said that her daughter never admitted. Okay, so then she became very distant and unavailable. At the same time, her daughter met Kevin Ware Jr. Um, and let me point out one of the problems people have with drugs. And, um, drugs will ruin your mind and drugs will make you do things that are foolish and stupid. Sometimes because you need money for those drugs. Sometimes because you start hanging with other people who do drugs and they're usually not the best character. And then the drugs mess up your mind and get you to hang with people that maybe you wouldn't hang with if you had a healthy lifestyle. So this is when she hooks up with this Kevin Ware guy, who was an ex NFL guy, but you see the word X is before NFL. So <laughs> something wrong there. All right. The mother says she didn't know about their relationship until six months into their dating. We felt a shift in her life. Okay, what kind of shift was it? Then it says that Pomaska was dating Kevin Ware Jr., a former American football tight end in the NFL for the Washington Redskins and the San Francisco 49ers. All right. So anyway, he hooked up with her. And then it says this. Uh, let's see. Um, hold on one second. She kept trying to meet with her do do uh, daughter, but the, there's always something getting in the way. Oh, we can't do that because my boyfriend has to do this, blah, blah, blah. 
They, they always canceled when it was time to be there. So obviously the, there's a separating happening between the, with the boyfriend separating her from her family or she's separating herself because of their own behaviors. So there's, that's always a big, huge, uh, red flag that the whole, some, something is really wrong in their lifestyle. All right. So last time this other guy who once dated her said, last time I saw her was on April 4th. She was gaunt and had bruises and some swelling on her face. It was a big difference, the physical transformation. It was shocking. So now we know it's probably domestic abuse evolved. Um, and there's probably, if she's getting gaunt, I'm going to say the drugs are eating up her, her body there. And she, you know, we probably know what kind of drugs those are. Um, so anyway, she did say to this ex-boyfriend that she had been hit by where I told her not to go back. And she said she was going back. So, you know, the, making poor choices after poor choices after poor choices. So anyway, um, she, she planned to go into, re, uh, she tried to help another friend, try to help her get into rehab, but it never happened. And then this person got an email from her and said, I need to talk to you. And that was the last they heard. So she was seen at this party. All right. Now, now get this one. All right. Six days after Pomaski was last seen, Ware was pulled over by deputies from the Montgomery County Police Department for allegedly speeding. Deputies said that during the search of this vehicle, they found cocaine, methamphetamine, which is why the girl is gaunt, marijuana, and Xanax. They allegedly also found an AK-47 and a 9mm pistol. Ware was arrested for possession of multiple controlled substances and for unlawful carry of weapons, and get this one, as a felon. And this is where I say, hold up here. All right. Why was she with a felon? And that, that drives me crazy. Yes, there are people who re become rehabilitated. This guy clearly was not that. You know, when, when, you know when, you, when you're hooking up with somebody, you know, their criminal background does make a difference. And unless they have changed their lifestyle completely, have become an honorable member of the community, you shouldn't be messing with them. Sorry. And if you're a dude that just got out of prison, you shouldn't be messing with anybody. You should be straightening up your life, walking the straight and narrow to the point where you can say, I've had this job for so many years. I don't touch, I don't touch drugs. I don't associate with any of those people anymore. I, people can vouch for me. And that's the only reason why you should even give me a chance. But, you know, I'm going to say he was doing all those things. He had guns, he had drugs, and he was a felon. And he was breaking the law and breaking the law and breaking the law. And she hooked up with him probably because she was already doing drugs and therefore wasn't thinking clearly. So, you know, it is just one of these sad things to me that, they, and, you know, that, that there's so many pieces of evidence where, where somebody's life is just going, going downhill. Um, and her body was found. Let's see what happened. Uh, they did find her. And he has been, I believe he's been arrested. Let me, let me see if I can find here. Um, okay, I'm just trying to, that was uh, the mother's story. I was trying to find out where the, I believe they arrest. Oh, here we go. Well, her remains have been found, so she's definitely dead. Um, and the, and the, uh, okay, the boyfriend is now the suspect. So um, they had a violent fight shortly before her disappearance. I guess that was the house party fight, a uh, violent fight. Um, and he... He was arrested on uh, the suspicion of possession of controlled substance and a firearm, but he posted $23,000 bond the next day. Um, and let's see. Oh, he also had been arrested before for violating his bond. Now, let's see what other things this guy do. Um, so at this point, they're just saying he's a suspect. Let's face it. I'm, I'm going to say there are no other suspects. But I just, you know, I look at a case like this and I think to myself, you know, there's so many steps you take to getting yourself into a situation where you can't get back out of. And I know people hate this. Oh, you're blaming the victim. But, you know, sometimes we just victimize the hell out of ourselves. You know, we, 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 keep, we keep making bad choice after bad choice after bad choice. We don't say, oh, my, man, I made one bad choice. I got to back out of that. I got to go get help now. It's just, it just, it just um, you know, snowballs. And it's really sad because, unfortunately, when you're snowballing, there's usually somebody there to stomp on you. So, because they see a, they see a person 
who is out of control. They see a person who's desperate. They see a person they can control. Um, so you become a target. If you don't get one, you know, if, you, if you're messed up, you know, you're not going to be a victim of one person. You're probably going to be a victim of a whole bunch of people, you know, either all at the same time or in a row, you know, because you set yourself up as a victim and, and they see it. They see, they see it right there. They get thinking five minutes with that person. They're like, yeah, I can take advantage of that. Yep, sure I can. And uh, so really sad. So, you know, I just uh, I always try to warn people, you know, don't keep don't don't allow yourself to snowball. You know, if you if you mess up you mess up go go get help right away don't 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 be embarrassed don't be ashamed to say man i need help i i gotta get help and i gotta get help now because i don't want to end up a victim somewhere so i just thought that was a really interesting um really interesting story um i'm just looking over here yeah i'm out there you're you're talking in the um i uh, uh, as far as the jambonet case i'm not going to get into all the details of the jambonet case it is it, you know, I, I suggest you watch my video on it. It's, it's one of these cases where there's a tremendous amount of information, there's a tremendous amount of misinformation, and a lot of it's caused by people writing books, you know, because they, 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 they glorify pieces of information. And, and what happens is on, on social media especially is that there's so much information that people can spend, and I've seen people spend hundreds of hours analyzing cases when they're not profilers. They're not detectives. They're just analyzing cases because they keep reading this person's thing and then they see this video and then they say, what about this and what about that? Folks, we're not going to solve the case. We're not, <laughs> you know, because we aren't there. We have, I, ha I did not get to um, interview the Ramses. I did have an email with John Ramsey because I had a personal viewpoint on uh, that note that was written. It was very strange and that matched something and I have that in my, in my video. So I contacted John Ramsey over it and he brushed, he blew me off. Um, that's the only contact I had with the Ramses. I've, I was not working inside that case. I did not, I did not, I have seen, you know, autopsy information and so on and so forth, but I'm still telling you from the outside, you, you, there's so much you just don't get that from the cases I worked when I actually worked them, I know what's on the inside. And that's why to me, sometimes what's most fascinating is, um, when I've worked on a case and I see what the media puts out and then I see how people react to that media and I know it's garbage and I know they're missing, they're misinformed and they're, and they're, they're jumping on things that don't even, they're not even true. And, and they're all getting, Oh, I think this, Oh my God, how about that? Did you hear about this? And I'm like, none of those things are true. That isn't the way it went down. There's, this is not even the proper evidence, but if you're outside the case, you don't know that, you know, you just don't, you know, it's how would you know? You know, because you're being manipulated by whomever. It could be you're being manipulated by the media because they want a good story. It could be the defense team. A lot of times the defense team are the master manipulators. It could be a police department that doesn't want you to know that they screwed up um, or whatever. Or they're just not going to release that information. They don't want you to see everything they've done. Um, so you just don't know. And because I've been on the inside of these cases, I know better. And I know some, some cases are shocking in the sense that I've had a couple cases where when the person was taken into court, I'm like, that was not the case I worked. I mean, I did work that case, but that's not how it went down. And I cannot believe they put this, they, they, this guy's been arrested. I mean, it makes no sense. And I'm, sometimes I have one case, um, I'm gonna, I might do that case sometime because they arrested this guy. I'm like, how in the heck? They, they, they had nothing linking him to the scene except after like seven confessions, he confessed to what they wanted him to. And I worked for the sheriff on that case. Um, and uh, the police chief, I can't quite remember which one it was on that case, but he, he brought me in and he gave me the information. And this was not actually, the family didn't bring me into this case. A lot of times the family will ask me to look at a case and the police will reluctantly let me look at it. Um, but this, in this case, I was contacted directly by law enforcement. I was working with law enforcement and I went through the case. I analyzed it. I, I came up with what I thought. And that police chief was in a hundred percent agreement with me, said, my God, this makes total sense. This is, this is so what, what probably went down this. And, and we, and we knew who did it between the two of us. We knew exactly what happened. And then some, then it got taken over by the state at some point 
And the state sent somebody in there and they got this, this loser to confess. And I'm like, that's not, and, and I looked at the evidence that the way they said um, he did it. And I'm like, this, that's just not what happened at the scene. I've seen the crime scene photos. That's not what happened. And the funny thing was, uh, well, he got arrested and he was, he was convicted and the family was in the court. And, and the son of the woman who was murdered was in the court. And the convicted guy got up after he was convicted, stood up, pointed at the son, who was, the son was about 45 years old, so it wasn't a kid, pointed at his son and said, you slick man, you slick. <laughs> and he was right, because <laughs> I don't think he did it. And, but that case has never got any publicity. It just went down, it just disappeared. And people are none the wiser. And a few people who did hear about the case go, oh, good, they got that guy. I'm like, no, they didn't. I mean, the guy was a, the guy was a psychopath. I mean, the guy was a, was a, was a, was a, not a nice guy, okay? The guy was, was a psychopath. I mean, it's, he was, you know, that he spent the rest of his life in prison didn't really bother me. But he didn't do it, you know. So that's, that's the problem, um, that we on the outside often just are off on, on what we actually know about the cases. And, and here's, here's a really kind of good example. Um, cause somebody asked me to talk about the Beaumont children. Okay. And this is an Australian case and I decided to do it today because this is, uh, at least if you're from Australia, you could have been here and be awake. Um, <laughs> um, and I won't do a whole show on the Beaumont children because you know, I'm not writing a book on it. If I were, if I were, if I were being paid a hundred thousand dollar advance to write, write a book that I spent five years investigating and spent all this time in Australia going through every, all the police files and every, 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 uh, newspaper report and every suspect, you know, so I can write a book that probably isn't even correct, but you know, Hey, you're paying me for it. I'll do it. But the, nobody's doing that. So this doesn't even make a show. I can't do a full show on this because I can't prove anything. Um, and, but people are obsessing over the cases like this. And I want to point out some of the just really bizarre things you're going to see that come up in a, in an unsolved case. And then next week, somebody asked me to do the, um, hold on a second. Uh, okay. I'm going to say, uh, 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 Bible John, Bible John case. Um, the Bible John case, which is out of, out of uh, the UK. Um, and so I'm going to do it for next week because that's that's UK uh, timing. Uh, and same, same serious problem there. I would not do a whole show on it because it's pointless. And and I have a really interesting thing that happened by somebody who did write a book on it. And it's really fascinating. I'm going to do that one next week. So hopefully I don't forget. But this one is the, the disappearance of the Beaumont children, Australia's most notorious missing person case and just so you see the little kitties there they are they're the nice little children's um and it is a really weird case um what happened was this was jan this was uh january 1966 on a summer day jane arna and grant beaumont boarded a bus to the nearby oh lord it's a it's an australian word i can't pronounce it g l e n e l g anybody want to try <laughs> glenel the beach <laughs> I can't pronounce it I have no idea how you pronounce that word uh, they went to the nearby beach and they never returned okay um, it was Australia Day in 1966 wow Australia Day gets a lot of crimes because I did that the one about the the the, uh, the guy that got murdered on his um, boat and that was Australia Day too so what is it about Australia Day that brings out killers hmm. Anyway, it was Australia Day. Nine-year-old Jane Beaumont had chaperoned her sister, seven-year-old Arna, and her brother, four-year-old Grant, to the little beach. Um, this was not the children's first unsupervised outing, as Jane had precociously learned the local bus routes. So she was only nine, which I just, you know, I, I have an eight-year-old granddaughter, and I'm kind of like, you know, I can't imagine her taking buses, but okay. Um, Besides, the beach was only a five-minute ride away, and they had always returned home safely. So apparently they did this a bunch of times, which I just want to point out. One of the issues you have with uh, children going someplace repeatedly is that they set a pattern up, and 
if they set up a pattern and anybody gets their eyes on them, then they then they can start stalking them. Um, so on, but uh, so they always returned home safely un until they didn't, um, which was January 26, 1966. Parent, parents and police launched a years-long quest to find them and became one of the most sensationalized stories in the country. Though some witnesses came forward regarding a suspicious man seen luring the kids away, he was never identified. And no signs of life surfaced in the ensuing years. More than half a century later, the mystery still is unsolved. All right, so, so apparently it was a hot day. They took an 8.45 a.m. bus and they were supposed to come back by noon, but they never did. The children's father returned from work around three, drove to the beach to find his kids. He checked the bus stop and combed the beach, but to no avail. Well, wait a minute, they were supposed to be home by, oh, noon or two o'clock bus. So I guess by the two o'clock bus, they wondered. But you know, that's a long time to be at the beach for a nine-year-old. What was the other, the other kids are smaller. That's a long time to be at a beach, but all right. Um, he checked the bus stop and combed the beach, but to no avail. Then they knocked on the doors of the neighborhood and then they couldn't find him. So they went missing. Um, now, a local marina was drained when a woman reported. See, this is, this is where things start going. I want to show how there can be like a ridiculous number of suspects, a ridiculous number of theories that just start coming out of the woodwork because, because A, they don't know anything. They have no idea who it is. And B, people will come, people, citizens, will come forth with, and they will claim that they know things that they don't, or they saw things that they didn't, or thought, or saw, or thought they saw something, but it wasn't them, that kind of thing. So anyway, the first thing they got was somebody, a, a, a woman said she had spoken to three children matching the Beaumont siblings' descriptions near a local marina. So they drained that sucker. I don't know how you drain a marina, but apparently they did that and they found nothing. Then witnesses said that they spoke of a tall, slender man in his 30s. He was described as a sun-baked swimmer in a blue Speedo and seen shepherding a group of kids in, into the distance. Some recalled the children being rather comfortable with a stranger as they knew him. Hmm. As if they knew him, sorry. Investigators later discovered that Arna had previously told her mother that Jane had got a boyfriend down on the beach. Initially dismissed as a cheeky joke about some boy Jane met on a previous outing. I mean, that child's not very old. Um, it now appeared to Nancy Beaumont that perhaps this sunbaked predator had befriended her ch children long ago. And, and this, again, is the problem with r children repeatedly going someplace alone, is that then a predator can start grooming them for the time that he's eventually going to make his move. Um, so they also, let's see what else, uh, they did other things meanwhile. Uh, desperate for clues, get this one. Now this is something I have to speak on because that pisses me off and always has. Uh, police flew in, flew in, flew in. Dutch clairvoyant named Gerard Croissant, Crossit or Croissant, whatever the hell it is. You know, I would like one if Australia would fly me in to profile a case. But guess what? They're not going to. Did you know why police don't bring in profilers, but they'll bring in psychics? This is why. Because a profiler will see the actual files. The profiler will actually see what the police are doing. And they don't like outside people mucking around in their business. A psychic isn't bothering in their files or them. Because they're not going to look at anything because they don't need to because they're psychic, right? So they can bring somebody in and just appease the public or even some police actually think they might have something to offer, which just pisses me off. Um, I am, I have, I will say, I'll say it over again. I am 100% against any psychic having anything to do with a police case. And I think any police agency that allows a psychic to, in, to, to give them any credibility is an absolutely wrong thing to do. It, 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 it destroys it confuses the families, confuses the community. It gives credibility to somebody who has no credibility in police work. And it, it just, I find it offensive, highly offensive. I mean, if you, if you, if people want to go, go pay a psychic or one of those stupid Hollywood psychics to tell them about something because they're just, you know, in my opinion, grifters and fakes and con men. Okay. Spend your money and, and believe that they've talked to your loved ones on the other side. Have at it, you know, 
You can do what you want. You can believe what you want, but stay out of police cases. And I've never, I've had psychics contact me over and over on police cases. And I've never been right. Never. So anyway, <clears throat> that was my soapbox. Anyway, they brought this dude in. He claimed to have seen the Beaumont children in his mind. Oh yes. In his mind, buried in a warehouse kiln near their school. Oh, by the way, let me tell you how else this works. What some psychics do is, some psychics are actually good profilers. In other words, they, they look at the crime like I would and they profile from the evidence and come up with reasonable thoughts about what could have happened. They're not psychic, they're just profiling. But they'll also cheat. So what they'll do is they'll drive to the site and they'll look around and they'll find out what's there. Is there a red barn? Is there a tree? Is there a road that, you know, does a V? And they'll get that. And then they'll claim they never were near that place. So when they go, Oh, I see a red barn and a tree and a road that has, you know, uh, as a fork there. Please go, oh, oh, how do they know that? Well, because they're cheating. That's how. So anyway, this guy supposedly found that, thought that they were buried in a warehouse kiln near their school. Here from, you're from Holland. How the hell do you know there's a warehouse kiln near their school? Oh, because you, in your mind you just knew that? Because that's pretty weird. My guess is you cheated. Somehow you cheated. So anyway... Locals formed a citizens action committee and raised $40,000 that could have gone to something really useful to demolish and excavate the site. It took a year, but the dig began and ended with authorities finding absolutely nothing in front of television crews. So now the police look like morons. The community has spent $40,000 and this jackass got a free trip to Australia. All right. Another lead suggested that they were living in the mud islands of Victoria. So an entire crew of a British freighter stationed there was questioned. And that yielded nothing. Then a woman claimed uh, she, for, that for nine months in 1966, she lived next door to the children in a desolate railway town. But no clues were found there either. That's probably she's full of crap and she's lying. Tragically, locals began to suspect the children's own mother of being involved. Because eventually, you know, sometimes they are, but you know, sometimes just they either you start thinking the parents are involved because you can't figure out who did it, or you start saying it's a police cover up and it's a police officer who did it. So then in March of 1986, the case appeared on the brink of being solved when authorities found three suitcases in a residential garbage can. The cases were stuffed with newspaper clippings about the children, with lines and headlines crossed out, and ominous comments scrawled in red ink. Not in the sand hills, in the sewage drain, the comment read. Oh my God. So they're thinking, oh my God, this is the creepy dude keeping the souvenirs. No, no, no. It was an elderly amateur sleuth who had passionately been following the case and her relatives threw these documents out when she died. So see, you've seen how things just compound and compound and compound. Oh Lord. So then there was somebody who was a former detective thought it was a woman in Canberra actually was Jane, the adult Jane, but then they found out she wasn't the adult Jane. No, the kids are dead. Okay, I'm just going to say it. The kids are dead. So now they're going to see the kids everywhere, right? Oh, uh, and now they've come up with murder after murder after murder, or suspect after suspect. Then they said the rabbit hole deepened when two brothers told the police that a factory owner had asked them to dig a ditch on his property. And of course, they tore up that property, and they came up with non-human bones. Uh, and so it turned out that... Um, some, some, somebody's son thought his you know, dad did it. You know, the old, you know, I claim dad did it thing, you know. Like like the Black Dahlia. You know, Steve, what's his face, who claims his father killed Black Dahlia. He didn't. Um, and you can watch my Black Dahlia show on that. Um, so eventually, yeah, they came up with nothing. Came up with absolutely nothing. So, There's no, if I looked into this case, I'm going to come up with absolutely nothing either because what, what I've got here is, is a whole, a whole just jumble of junk, a jumble of junk that, that I can't point to anything. The only thing I thought was actually interesting, and I just happened to notice this in the beginning, and the thought did cross my mind. Uh, what crossed my mind was I, had, I have done the thing on the, the, the Wanda Beach murders, right? Um, the two girls were, were, were murdered in Wanda Beach, um, and that was in the Sydney area. And um, my suspect in that is Christopher Wilder. And you can go watch that one. It's called, called um, what did I just say it was? Um, 
Wanda Beach, the Wanda Beach murders. Um, Christopher Wilder is a serial killer. He's an American serial killer, but he was living in Australia, and I believe he killed those he killed those girls. Interestingly enough, he killed those girls in 1965, in my opinion. Good. Let me put it this way: He's a great suspect. He's dead. He can't sue me. But he is a great suspect in the, the that those um, homicides, and he's a serial killer. That was in 1965. Well, the Beaumont children is 1966. It's just a year later. It's in Adelaide, uh, Adel, Adel, yeah, Adelaide. Um, and it's about, I looked it up, um, I think it was an 11 hour drive from there. But you know, killers you know, over a year's time can go to another location, maybe staying with somebody or whatever they're doing, getting a job, visiting. And he was also a beach guy because Wanda Beach, that, he, was a, he was a surfer dude. And this sounds like the same surfer dude. And I looked up to see whether Christopher Wilder had ever been considered as a possible suspect in, in the Beaumont children. And I, I can't find anything on it at this point. Um, I, I don't know if there, for some reason, Christopher Wilder couldn't have been in the area. He couldn't have done it. But I'm, I'm real curious about it. That's the only thing I'm curious about is because, because it's interesting to me that the, the description is similar in both cases. And they're both Australian cases that a year apart. Um, these kids were a little bit younger than the teen girls he grabbed, but he, you know, he was kind of like indiscriminate. Um, so he might have wanted the older girl and just knocked off the other two because they were just in the way. But I'd, I'd be curious whether there's any link between this and the, this, the, the, two, the two homicides, um, set of homicides and Christopher Wilder. So I'm going to look into that a little bit just because I'm curious about that. But other than that one suspect that I could actually say is a serial killer and I believe committed the Wanda Beach murders, he at least has some, but the rest of these people, I don't know who they are. They're just, they're just a whole pile of names. Um, people, these people pointing at this and pointing at that and saying, this guy's creepy, that guy's creepy. And it, it, it's so many years later, you know, unless I say, unless somebody paid me a whole bunch of money to write a book and I'm going to spend hours and hours and hours going through all the historical data. <laughs> it, it's not something one can even begin to solve, you know? So, um, yeah. Yes, this is it's Steve. Yeah, that's his name. Uh, Steve Hodel. Yeah, he, he's an idiot. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> the, his his claims on his father are so ridiculous. I mean, absolutely ridiculous claims. So no, I don't believe his dad killed Elizabeth Short at all. I think, and I went, I go through all the stuff, and he he has made a, um, let's say a, a huge amount of money, and he's got this. He's writing book one, book two, book three, book four. He's, he's, he's pulling this. He's getting as much money as he can possibly get out of this. Um, and not only does he think his dad killed Elizabeth Short, he thinks his dad was Zodiac. And he thinks his, he, he thinks his dad was like every famous killer there ever was. So, you know, the guy's Looney Tunes. I'm sorry, Steve Hodel, you're Looney Tunes. And you have no evidence to support what you're saying. But you are getting a huge, he's got this like entourage of, of, of you know uh, people who believe the theory and every t he's got a whole website he's got the new books come out and everybody's just jumping on board you know okay steve i see you, you know you've got this piece of evidence now on your dad he has see what a person like that does in my opinion is they they throw out these little enticing crumbs to people and make everybody feel welcome as profilers um so that they can get these people to give them a total bunch of money to buy their books to, to you know, however he's getting a ton of money off these people. Um, you know, and so it's a whole industry. He makes a whole industry out of claiming his father is the murder of, of, of the Black Dahlia. You know, yeah. His father, I, I'm not, I don't know what kind of dad his father was. Maybe he wasn't the best dad in the whole world, but hey. You know, he didn't kill the Black Dahlia, and you just, you're just a fraud. I'm sorry. I think so. That's why I think about him. It just really bugs me. I, ha I hate it when I see somebody, you know, you know, it's one thing when, if there's enough evidence to make you say, well, you know, and he went, you know, you know, there was a re reasonable amount of evidence, blah, blah, blah. But he's, he, he does things, he does things like, well, and then I found this photo of this woman. It was Elizabeth Short. And everybody looks at him and goes, no, it's not. <laughs> Just because his father had a photo of a woman with dark hair that he thought looked like Elizabeth Short, he claims that's her, and nobody thinks it is, so, except him. So, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Amanda says, it isn't a lead if there is no evidence to support it. That's correct. Uh, do the police just want to appear to be doing something? Uh, yes. 
uh, one of the things that happens, and I, I, I don't fault police departments for this, the pressure in some cases, let's face it, in most cases, there is not much pressure because an awful lot of the people who get murdered are people that sort of deserve to be murdered. <laughs> I hate to say that, but they're, they're murderers themselves uh, or they... Um, uh, they're, they're major drug dealers. They've been in and out of prison 20 times. They're scumbags. They're causing, they're, they're poisoning the kids in the community. You know, so when they get killed, they get shot in some dispute or whatever, gang thing or whatever. You know, yeah, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a, they're like a couple family members care, but the rest of the community is like, ah. And the detectives are like, oh, well, <laughs> you know, well, we're, we're going to work the case. We're going to try to get the guy that killed them because that's what we do. But we're not bent out of shape over it. But then you get three children, three innocent children. And that 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 really hurts the police department's hearts. I mean, those, those, most people work in police departments are parents, you know, they're parents. By the time you get to be a detective, you've got children. There's very few detectives that don't have children. Um, and so they see in those children, their children, and they, they upset them so much because I say all these other cases, they can just, but that that nails them and they want very much to solve that case and they feel a great responsibility because it is their responsibility and they're desperately trying to solve the case and on top of trying to solve the case because it's children and it's a, a sensational case the community has gone berserk the media has gone berserk they're being hounded the, the papers are everywhere saying what are you doing what are you doing are you solving this case and they're like doing everything we can. We haven't gotten any leads. We don't have leads. So what they say to, to the, you know, to, to the um, people is that we're working on it. We're, we're following every lead that we can follow. Um, and they don't have to say what the lead is, but if, if something comes in, uh, oftentimes they will pursue something that is public, public so that they look like they're doing something like digging someplace up because then they can, people can see physically they're doing something. If they're just following leads in the office, doing interviews and, you know, bringing people in and talking to them, the public doesn't know about these things. So sometimes doing those, you know, sweeps in the community and, 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 and doing uh, searches and, and digging up things, those kind of things get positive media attention and get the community to feel like the police are doing their best. Um, so, yeah, but you're right. A lead, let me put up your question again, your point, it's not really a lead if there's no evidence to support it. Yes, that 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 jackass psychic, that wasn't a lead. That was that was a stupidity of a police department and a waste of community money. There's no lead in that. Um, when people claim things, that's not a lead. It's something you have to check out. You know, if somebody says, "I was living next to these three kids," and maybe, it's, and so they're thinking, "Well, maybe they were kidnapped and you know were being kept someplace." Um, it's not, it's, they got to check it out because the lead is something that is based on evidence where the other stuff is something you just check out. That's the way I would look at it. They might call them leads, but it's like, you know, yeah, you get like tip lines. A tip line brings in, doesn't bring in dozens and dozens of leads. It brings in a whole bunch of mostly crap. And then a few things that may be interesting that you want to check out. A lead starts coming in when you actually have like you point out some kind of evidence. So it's true witness evidence or physical evidence or, you know, tire tracks or whatever. Um, those are real uh, pieces of evidence. And I, I'm going to say this because, you know, I've been kind of on, I've been on, I'm on a Hawaii Five-0 kick right now and I'm rarely watch crime shows. Uh, so I'm on the fourth season of the original Hawaii Five-0. Extraordinarily well written. But what's so cool is what you're talking about with leads. They actually follow what I would call leads in that show very interesting leads and so it actually keeps my attention and they're like looking at the different things and they're following the actual evidence and information that makes sense and so it's a very intelligent show i'm not saying that's you know things happen like that in real life to that extent but of the shows out today so much of it is garbage this actually i just go oh that's really interesting how they're they're checking this out and then they're going here and then they're, then they're they're not doing the stuff you see either with the computers today where oh what we're gonna put in this and oh look there's only one person who bought a a a, uh, a lead pencil with this number on it from this company in in Cincinnati Ohio during the J July of 1963 and like really you got that off your computer you know it's not like that when they check things out 
they actually it's things that actually make sense that they went through the process of checking out. Very, very interesting. So really great show if you actually want to see how you should think and how you should follow leads. I think it's a great show for detectives or detectives to be. Um, I'm not going there yet because, oh Lord, here we go again. Um, yeah, I just saw that today about Michael Jordan supposedly molested a child. I don't know. You know, we're in the, we're in the me too, me too and me too movement. Um, and this again gets very difficult to know whether people are have really been molested or they're just claiming they have been molested and then if that information gets out to the public now it's out in the public and then then what happens is some some nephew or some niece that was hanging around and will claim she was molested and then everybody's in on the money you know so it gets very difficult to know who's just making crap up and where the truth is i will look at that um and i didn't look at it yet i i will See if there's anything to talk about, and I'll talk about it on the next Hangout. Um, oh, no, not his late father. No, his late father molested his daughter. And how does he, well, again, it, how does he know it doesn't matter? I mean, I, I mean, I hate to say that, but, you know, part of me is just really tired of everybody airing every single bad thing that happened in their lives in, 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 the, in the street. You know what I mean? It's... You know, sometimes crappy things do happen and people, and if they're dead, they're dead. And, you know, it's like, well, you know, they're dead, they're dead. Um, I'm not, you know, if there's somebody who, I don't know, I'm just, I think it's just gotten out of, kind of out of hand to some extent. Um, and, uh, well, I don't know about this, mockery of the seriousness of cases. Um well, yeah, I think the psychics do that. If that's what you're talking about, I, yeah, it, it's they, they have no business. There's no business. If you want to, you want to, you want to do this as a parlor trick. That's fine. And I know there's going to be. I'll probably lose about 20 people who all will now now stop following me. Uh, they'll stop subscribing because they're all say, well, we're psychics and we're we're we don't we're not here for the money. And we're not here to take advantage of people. And we're we're not grifters. We really do have psychic abilities. Okay. I'm sorry. Don't believe it. Never will. So Psych is, is so two good shows. To, is uh, what's, what's the two shows with Psych? Psych uh, the the um, uh, the two uh, the two shows with psychics in it. Uh, psych is one of them when he pretends to be a psychic and he's not. And the other one is um, oh shoot with Patrick um, who also pretends he's a psychic. Both of those are amusing shows and neither one of them are actually psychics. They're profilers is what they are. So um, let's see. Uh, see here we go. Uh, I want to point out this. This is one thing I will say with the Jean Bonnet case. <clears throat> Cyril Wecht is determined that the the, CO, uh, the cause of death was strangulation. Other experts don't agree with him, though. So it's a battle of the experts. Here we go again. The last show that I did um, uh, on the, the, uh, the Brazilian show, uh, the second case had the issue of whether the guy was murdered or uh, committed suicide. Um, and Cyril Wecht was involved in that. I think, yeah, it was Cyril Wecht, wasn't it? Yeah, and he said it was a homicide, and I don't know where he gets that from. I disagree with him entirely. And and I've read, you know, I, I've studied Cyril Wecht's stuff, and a lot of his stuff is very good. So, you know, I don't know if I agree or disagree with him here. You know what I'm saying? So we get these experts, and they're on two different sides, and I'm, as I always point out, somebody's not right. Somebody has to be not right. There's only one right. You know, it, if there's if there's two experts on on a cause of death, only one of them is correct because there's only one cause of death. And if there's two experts on what the blood spatter pattern means, there's only one person who's right, and the other one is either just wrong, which he can be, or is lying, which if you've been paid by the defense attorney, you may well be lying. Um, I'm going to do um, uh, Sunday. I'm going to do the Phil Spector case. Um, and that was an interesting case of blood issue and of the two two witnesses and i was really shocked at one of the uh forensic pathologists who who spoke in that case and i'm thinking i've read your book and that's not what you say in your book so interesting stuff um and let's see what else here uh by the way for for uh, this friday i'm going to do the lynn family murders in australia uh, that was a um a mass murder um of an entire family by what the, the another family uh, relative was arrested for it. He had three trials, um, and it's very interesting how the juries failed to really come up with much. And um, 
how he ended up getting convicted mostly by a judge and not the jury. So it was very, very interesting. Um, so I'll be talking about what happened in that crime and, and why it happened and um, what happened with the jury and the, and the judge. Um, so that's going to be, that's going to be an interesting one. Now, the last thing I just want to talk about, let me see here. Let me see. I'll be sure I haven't, there's one other thing I want to talk about and that's just, um, hold on a second. Uh -huh. Oh, no, I can't forget to talk about this one. This one's just, uh, unwell, uh, you know, the, um, <laughs> this one is the case of this, this guy here. You see, the, the guy, the, ah, what happened here? Okay, there he is. What, what, why are we doing this? Oh, don't do that. Come up here. Come up here. Somebody said I'm using an old-fashioned way because I don't have the thing to click on here. Yeah, I'm, I'm just being lazy. Um, so the guy on the, the right, of course, is, is, the, is the guy who is the prisoner. And the woman on the left worked for the prison system and was highly respected. And they disappeared together. Mm. Okay, so and originally they thought she had been kidnapped. And originally I thought, no, she hasn't. And let's see, I'll tell you what happened to him. So what happened was, she's a corrections official accused of helping a murder defendant escape from jail last week. And originally, the guy said they had a non-physical special relationship. No, it was not. It was not. It was not physical because he was in prison. But he was very special. Like he got more food than the other inmates got, and he got all these little treats and deals via via the corrections official. And if that was true, I don't know why she was even allowed to keep keeping her job. Anyway, she was the. Her name was Vicky White, and his name is uh, Casey White. Not not related. Um, she was the assistant director of corrections for Northwestern Alabama's Lauderdale County. And she'd been in the job for like almost two decades. Um, right. And they thought she was perfectly good worker and everything else. She thought that was fine. Um, but now they're finding out that Casey White got special privileges and was treated differently while in the facility than the other inmates that should have popped up, but apparently not. So she claimed that he, uh, she had to take, him to the courthouse for um, a mental health evaluation. And then she was going to get medical care because she hadn't been feeling well. Turns out there was no hearing at the courthouse and she had no medical care scheduled either. Um, as a matter of fact, she was not even supposed to take him out of the prison without having two people doing it. But she came up with an excuse that nobody was, other person was available. So she had a patrol car, they got in the patrol car and then her patrol car was found abandoned in a shopping center parking lot. And, um, so they said that this was her last day at work. She was retiring and she submitted her paperwork, sold her home about a month ago and had thought about moving to the beach. Yeah. Well, she was moving someplace, but not, not, not to the beach. So she was supposedly a model employee, unblemished record. So what the heck you wonder would be, would be happening here. Um, so let me, let me, so what happened was they, Vicki White's patrol car stopped about eight minutes after leaving jail near a shopping center and then she she had already bought another car and they jumped in that car and they took off so with that car um they have unknown alabama plates um and they're looking for them he's he's six foot nine <laughs> that dude should stand out in the crowd um six foot nine okay and may have changed his appearance but not his height since leaving jail okay now now this is this is what gets interesting all right she is 58 years old. He's in his, he's in his late thirties. So we're already seeing a 20 year age difference. Okay. And what do you think could be inspiring her to do this? Now, this won't be the first time that a corrections person falls in love with a criminal because remember these criminals are psychopaths and they know how to play people, especially people with issues. Uh, the issues usually have a level of narcissism involved that the, like in this case, a female would be very narcissistic and she needs attention. She needs to feel validated, um, in a big way. Um, and here she is an, you know, a woman who's getting near my age. And now this, 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 you know, hot younger dude is interested in her. Right. Um, so but guess, look at his background. And you think to yourself, you've been, you've been in corrections for how long? You should know that a good portion of these people are psychopathic. They're criminal. They're, they're, they're dangerous. And you, you should not be messing around with them because they will, they will play you to get what they want. Okay. 
He was serving 75 years in prison for a series of crimes in 2015, including a home invasion, carjacking, and a police chase. He was also being, had transferred from a state prison to the detention center temporarily to attend court hearings on two capital murder charges he faced relating to a 2015 stabbing death of 58-year-old Connie Ridgeway. Okay, so, so he was a, a, basically a lifelong uh, criminal, and he's a murderer. And he murdered a woman who was 58 years old. So I would think for the, the correction officer who was in her early 60s, you might not want to hook up with them because you're going to get a knife in you. Um, so she brought, they figured he, they're armed, which they are because she had her own gun and this AK-47 they also had. Uh, he also made a shank while he was in prison. He had that with him. Um, so as part of her job, Vicki White was frequently throughout the cell blocks, and she had contact with all of the inmates at one time or another. But as far as a romantic relationship or something like that, we have no evidence or proof that was the case, although it's a possibility. <laughs> you think? And now it's kind of funny because now uh, the next one that came out on that, if I can find it here, um, now they're saying... Oh, yeah, they have a romantic thing. Oh, yeah, here, I think this is it now. This is the sheriff. Missing corrections officer willingly participated in inmates' escape. Yeah, I would think, he says the pieces of the puzzle are coming together. I think they came together pretty quickly. Um, so where, where does it say here? Um, oh, we also learned, this is the pre-sentencing report. I think it's interesting. He warned that if he made threats against his ex-girlfriend and sister and said if he ever got out, he would kill them. Okay, you know, why are you going off with a dude like this? Really? I mean, you're insane. So, so now they're saying the pair should be considered dangerous and may be armed with an AR-15 AR rifle, handguns, and a shotgun. Um, and so off they go. So it's like Bonnie and Clyde now. Uh, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you, you wonder, now, the, now the, guy, the, the police chiefs are just trying to say, you know, please turn yourselves in. Um, is it boredom? Is it loneliness? Is it, you know, you're, you're feeling like you're not, you know, you're not being paid attention to by men anymore so that, you know, you're just willing to believe anything and do anything? Here's a woman who's always been on the right side of the law and now she's playing Bonnie and Clyde. Is she suicidal in the sense that she just wants one but last roll in the hay with a, you know, whomever and a last moment of super excitement. Instead of retiring, I guess, maybe retirement just wasn't for her, you know. She's like, I can't just sit around and be bored and be retired and play bingo. I can't do it. No, I think I'll break this dude out of prison and, yeah, we'll go on the run. It'll be exciting. You know, it's, a, it's just an interesting story to, say, to ha see that happen. Only the lonely. Yeah, I think so. Um, have you seen Love After Lockup? Mm. I mean, that show only exists because people do this fairly often. Yeah, you know, um, as a matter of fact, I did a Dr. Oz show on exactly the same thing. Um, and I remember this so well because the family was in the front row. <clears throat> and the, 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 their sister, I think it was like, there was a mother and a sister. And then her sister was the one that did this kind of thing. And so Dr. Oz, I'm sitting right there and Dr. Oz is asking me, why this you know what happened and, and it gave an explanation of um how you know for some some women you know uh hooking up with the box boy over at uh the the giant food store is doesn't give them enough um make them feel like they're enough of a person i mean that's not an exciting thing and nobody's going to go oh you're with what a, you know, you want with the guy who stocks the shelves you know um they want attention they want to be noted um, that's why you marry Ted Bundy in prison, right? Because you can say, I'm marrying Ted Bundy in prison. I mean, things like that where you're just like, why would you, why would you want to hook up with a serial killer? Because it makes you somebody instead of absolutely nobody, you know. Um, and, and so I pointed that out, that she had, that she wasn't totally taken by this guy, that she was doing her own taking, that she had these psychological needs, that she, wa she had, to have, um, had to have this attention, um, and uh, Dr. Oz apparently didn't like that, what I said, so he just cut me out of the show. So, <laughs> so I don't have a copy of that show because I'm not in it. But, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, let's see. Uh, Carrie says, in the 1990s in Oklahoma, Bobby Parker, the warden's spouse, ran off with inmate Randolph 
Dial. The Parkers divorced. She served time and he died in prison. Yeah, amazing. Oh, and this is true, Amanda. Scott Peterson has a whole fan club of women. You betcha, he sure does. And so what's and what's his name does too? Um, oh, uh, I always forget his name. I don't know why. I, I got the black the guy with killed his two daughters and wife. Um, that everybody's like gaga over. Um, so he too now has a massive fan club uh, who think he's innocent or forced into it by his mistress or his wife drove him to it as his mother would say. Come on now, somebody give me the name. Um, <laughs> why am I drawing a blank? The guy in Colorado. Good looking dude. I did a show on him. <laughs> I'm blanking. <laughs> Somebody will come up with it in a second. Um, it's like it's like one of the top, now it's like one of the top searches on YouTube. I mean, massive number of shows are being done on it because Chris, uh, Chris, uh, Chris, what's his name? Chris. <laughs> Just drawing a blank. Anyway, him, not Drew Peterson, Chris, Chris, the guy in, the guy in Colorado. Drew, uh, Drew Peterson hasn't really gotten a lot. Of the, no, not the cop. No, Chris. Chris Watts. Chris Watts. Hell, fine. Finally, Chris Watts. <laughs> Chris Watts, the guy in Colorado who killed his wife and his two little girls and put them in the, uh, up in the, what were they, the oil tanks or whatever. Chris Watts, yes. Um, there is so many, he's got a, such fan clubs now and so many people giving him excuses. His mother is really into giving him excuses how his wife just ma made him crazy and to the point where he lost it and, um, you know, of course, he claimed originally that his wife killed the little girls and then he killed his wife because he, she killed the girls. But, you know, that story didn't really hold. So now even his mother has to sort of admit maybe he did kill them all, but only because he was driven to it, you know. So, you know, um, yeah, he'll get tons of fan, a fan club, too, because, you know, you can, like I say, you can date the guy down the street who's a nice guy. And, and probably the best thing that would ever happen to you, but no, it's not exciting enough. Um, so you'll go, for, you'll go for broke on somebody that everybody's going to be amazed that you're hooking up with, even if they're in a horrible way. They're like, oh, how could you do that? You can still go, oh, because I'm with this famous guy, you know. Um, so that's that's what happens, and it's yeah. I was like, I'm, I'll be curious to see how long it takes them to get caught. I mean, he he's so freaking tall. I mean, I think it's just like it's. It's easier to hide yourself when you're average height and you can change your face up and, you know, your hair and stuff. But, man, you're tall. You can't cut your legs off, you know. So, you know, I don't know, but I think they're going to get caught. But I say maybe they just want to last. They want excitement. He seems to be he seems, he seems to be willing to die. So uh, maybe she's just willing to die with him. She'd rather die on the run than retire. So that's my guess. Uh, the last thing I just kind of wanted just to mention because it's just something that I just think it's really sad. Um, we have we have two suicides this week. One is Naomi Watts, and the other one is um, the girl from uh, her name is uh, uh, Kate, Kayla Kayla Posey. She was the one that um, she had that that grinning girl one. You know the, that one, that cute little grinning girl gif is around. She was in the reality series Toddlers and Tiaras. Her her car was found in like a park, and um, so I originally thought she had had a car wreck, and I thought, oh, she's 16 years old. She's, you know, maybe a car wreck or something, and apparently she also committed suicide. So we have Naomi, um, uh, Naomi, uh, what did I say? Did I say, I didn't say Naomi Watts, did I? <laughs> Wait, no, <laughs> look, I've lost my mind. Uh, Naomi, the singer. <laughs> somebody, somebody didn't give me that name now. Yeah, oh, Lord, it's been a I'm not a country person. I don't. I don't do country. Winona, Winona Ryder, right? And now, geez, I've lost my. Okay, I'm going to look this up now because now I just. Uh, I'm. I'm. I'm not a country person, so I. I, I like some country music, but I'm not a follower of it. So, oh, Judds, the Judds. What the hell? Where am I at? <laughs> Too many, you know, sometimes you just have so many names running through your head, so many cases, so many names, and they just start, like, intersecting. So after a while, you're like, what the hell was that person? Naomi Judd, thank you. Uh, Naomi Judd. Okay, so Naomi Judd just uh, committed suicide, um, and, and so did this young 16-year-old who also was, uh, you know, a well-known celebrity. Um, and people often wonder, you know, what in the heck? 
These people have a very high profile. They're surrounded by people who admire them. They have a lot of money. Um, they're invited to fancy parties. They have great clothes. You know, they, they, they have all these things they can do. They have the kind of money that you could then explore any kind of interest you have in, the, in life. You can travel, you can start a new business, you can, you can pick a new hobby that's super expensive. You know, you can, you can do charitable work and give a ton of money away and help exactly that. You can actually create your own charity and just do it your way and do it right. I mean, and, and the 16 year old, she had done so many cool things and she had all these great things she was about to do. And you say to yourself, what the heck? You know, most of us don't have that level of opportunities um, in our lives. Um, and they had beauty. They had, uh, you know, fame, the beauty and fame. What would cause them to be so severely depressed? So, you know, to this point. Now, now Naomi Judd seems to say she's, she, I think substance abuse was definitely there. Uh, she talks about childhood abuse and, and other unfortunate things that happened earlier in her life. I think failures with raising your own children um, probably did dog her. Um, and the 16 year old, I don't know. We haven't heard any why she suffered from depression to that extent. And you know, I have a couple thoughts on that just as a closing thought. Um, one is one is a problem that I think that, I, unfortunately I think sometimes psychologists really push us and that's dwelling, dwelling on the past. Dwelling on a past you can't change. Dwelling on a past that maybe crappy things happened to you. And maybe you did crappy things, you know? And in my opinion, since you can't change the past, all you can do is do something good at the moment. So if, if, if somebody did something crappy to you, you can learn from that and then maybe help people who are in similar situations. If you do something crappy to somebody, then maybe you can say, hey, you know, the reason I did that is uh, because of whatever my reasoning is, maybe I can help other people uh, and sort of, you know, and uh, do penitence in a sense for that or repay society, you know, for, you know, the things, dam damage I might have done. Because um, we all, we're all not perfect, you know, and we all don't, you know, humans aren't perfect. And sometimes we're born to humans that aren't perfect and they can do damage. We're, maybe it could, it could be a school teacher who damaged us. It could be, it could be, um, a sister or brother, it could be a friend, it could be a neighbor, you know, people, there's, the damages can come from all kinds of places. It can be war. It can, it can be crim, criminal violence, um, that we're just an unlucky schmuck that gets hit by that. Um, but we can't change it. And if we've been able to, uh, move on, move, do, do well in life, to be able to get good work, make decent money in, in these cases of these two to gain fo fame and fortune as well that the to to the to pro, the problem of dwelling on the past i know people do it and they say they can't help it but i think that this is where i always think that when 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 psychiatrists don't work and therapists don't work with people to leave those things behind they do damage to people because dwelling never works it never does and it just makes you more depressed and more depressed and more depressed until you just, you, you wallowing in something you can't change. Um, so I always think it's real important to just recognize that you got that fickle finger of fate just whacked you on and, and, and you do what you can to, to help yourself move forward and to help other people. Um, but dwelling don't work. And that's one thing I think it really affects people. And the other thing that I think really affects people, and I think this is very true for people who are in, in, in very, high profile positions. It could be uh, very high profile business people. It could be, uh, you know, CEOs of companies. It could be politicians. It could be uh, celebrities, um, uh, celebrities, singers, whatever. And the problem I believe happens is, first of all, being overwhelmed, overwhelmed with responsibilities, overwhelmed with opportunities, overwhelmed with tasks that you must complete that the expectations are so high that you have to do this 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 and that and on the same hand you're almost addicted to it it's like a drug that you know you're going to one more television show one more singing engagement you're on the road uh, you know um uh and i think uh, naomi judd actually said when she stopped traveling on the road she just curled up on a, a sofa for two years because she couldn't handle not being on the road because it's adulation every place you go it's walking on stage it's a drug and so when you're in, you're running business deals, you're a CEO and you're doing business deal, business deal, business deals, 
you're a cop even, you know, you're a detective working homicide and you've been doing that and all of a sudden you retire. You know, you're so used to the adrenaline rushes and, and having all these things you're doing. In the same time, sometimes it's too much for you. And I think like the 16 year old, maybe it's just too much. Too much came too quickly and she's just like, I can't, I just can't deal with it. And so I just look at this and I think, you know, do it. I think sometimes people just get so overwhelmed with the fame, fortune, and responsibilities and that it's just, it's way more than any one human being should have to deal with. Um, and so I think sometimes I just want to check out because it's just, they're exhausted by the whole damn thing and they just, and maybe even get to the point where they have had so much they can't see anything in the future and they have no place to go now. They've been so high on the mountain and it's just a downward pitch. Um, and so, you know, um, Sometimes I think the balance of life, one really has to work hard when one is in a position of um, fame and fortune to balance that life because if you don't balance it, you, you know, you, you get to the point where you, you are literally on a drug high and, and it's, you know, you're addicted and, it, and it's very hard to ever live a normal life um, and be healthy. So that's just a thought on that. Um, <laughs> What, um, people think happiness is something that just comes to you and they get disappointed when it doesn't. Oh, I like that. Happiness is an active choice you have to work on. I so agree with that. When people say, you know, you don't deserve, you deserve to be loved. I'm like, really? <laughs> you don't deserve anything. Who deserves things? Oh, I deserve a nice house. I deserve a great job. I deserve a hot boyfriend. I deserve somebody to love me. No, I don't deserve anything. I'm, you know, that's something I have to to work to achieve. I have to work to get that nice house. I have to find find employment I like doing. And when it comes to love, you know, I have to be a type of person that people enjoy being around. And sometimes you're not even lucky then. <laughs> That's me. I'm still single. After being divorced for like, what now? 18 years. I'm single. Um, then I have to accept that too. Is I, you know, you know, I'm like, would I like to have a really great relationship with somebody? Oh well, yeah, but I just it hasn't happened. Um, maybe it's my fault it hasn't happened, <laughs> you know. But I'm not depressed over it because I accept responsibility for that, and I, and I like to point out, um, Amanda, I want happiness in my life. My happiness has to come in a way that I can achieve it too. Uh, it's my responsibility to achieve it by maybe doing YouTube, by, um, by accomplishing things I want to accomplish, uh, by traveling, because I love traveling, uh, and, I, and I have a, my granddaughter. So there's all these things, friends, all these things that can, I can put my efforts into for happiness. But I don't expect happiness, and I don't expect to be happy all the time, because, you know, sometimes you just wake up and go, God, this day sucks. And, it, you know, and sometimes bad things happen, you know. It's like, it's, and it just sucks when it happens. But... You know, um, you sort of choose a lot of these things. <laughs> yeah, I know. I just judged not Watts. <laughs> well, she, yeah, the, the Watts thing was stuck in my head. So you, that went, <laughs> um, let's see. Um, oh, th thank you. Good advice. I, I try. It's just, it's just a thought I had because, you know, I work in a world where there's a lot of very, you know, at least I did with television for so many years and. What I saw there was a lot of stressed out people. Um, uh, oh, look, I just put that one on already. But I love that, Amanda. Let's see, uh, Florence says, what happened to her? Time has not been kind. Somewhere I read prednisone. Well, first of all, what happens to anybody? I mean, you know, this always kind of drives me crazy. And people say, well, yeah, my God, look what they look like. You know, I watched the, 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 the last season, even, even though I'm not overly fond of the Jane Fonda show, um, um, Grace and Frankie. And I'm swear I'm looking at this. I'm looking at I'm looking at both of them. I'm thinking, damn! I wish I looked that good. I wish I looked that good six years ago. <laughs> They're in their 80s, and I don't I don't look that good. You know? I'm like, what the hell? I actually would like to do a video on that because what happens to people is they get older, and and what we're seeing with people is that we because this is another thing that causes them a great deal of stress. They're being seen in the limelight. And so they're doing, they're doing stuff to themselves all the time. They're doing plastic surgery. They're doing any kind of, uh, you know, facelifts. They're doing, you know, injection things and Botox and everything they can do. And when they get on stage or on television, they get heavy makeup. And they, they even get video, um, you know, 
you know, uh, editing, which will smooth out everything. If you look at Jane Fonda's face for the, most of those shows, I mean, unless you got, unless they get a real super close up of her, damn, her face is like perfect and wrinkles or anything. That's not normal aging because we're seeing the, and, and they see themselves also in that having to keep up that image instead of just being able to just be a natural, normal person. Now I, I, I do fake my, my thumbnails. I, <laughs> I use that face app thing and it's fun as hell. I'm like, Oh, look at this. I'm, Oh yeah. Hollywood too. I look 20 years younger. I like it. But when you see me here, it's just me. Uh, but you know, I decided I wasn't going to pursue all that extra work. Um, in my lifetime. Um, and also because I did sign language, I couldn't stand the thought of Botoxing and then I couldn't do the grammars on your, your eyebrows in, in sign language. And I'm like, if I can't raise my eyes, nobody will know what the hell I'm talking about. So, you know, so I would never do it, but the stress of it, instead of just, you know, being with your family and being able to enjoy life with your friends who don't give a crap that you look 10 years older, you've got to always be looking this way. And then people are always saying, what happened to you? You know, you got too, you, what happened to you? You got fat. What happened to you? You got wrinkly. What happened to you? You got old. You know, it's like, what happened to all of us? Yeah, it's called life. <laughs> oh God, it's what life. Um, who knows? <laughs> oh, thank you, Annie. Listening to you always makes me happy. I try not to depress everybody too much with miserable, horrible, topics that I talk about. You know, some people ask why I laugh during my shows. I'm like, because I, if I have to do one of these dead serious shows, because it is, there are gruesome topics and sad things happen and I'm discussing you know, the crime, crime issues and the analysis issues, but I just got to have some levity somewhere, you know, because that's how I balance things, you know, and, 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 and that gives me, you know, a much, much happier life than to drown myself in everything negative. So, <laughs> Oh, think of Joan Rivers. Her looks are amazing, but plastic surgery caused her death. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying people can't get plastic surgery. It makes them happy that, you know, and most of the time you don't die from plastic surgery. Uh, I'm not a surgery person. You know, I, 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 I don't, I don't go to doctors and I don't like, hosp I, I worked in hospitals and I worked for doctors, but because I worked in medical work for a long time as a sign language interpreter, but I never go to them. I, I'm just a kind of a, I just don't, um, I don't. So, I pretty much cure myself of anything wrong and uh, hope I never have to see the inside of a, an operating room. Uh, but that's me. And other people aren't, don't have that kind of fear. They're like, okay, just put me out, you know, put me out. And when I wake up, you know, I'm going to look like this. And, and oh, I, I will say this in defense of people who get plastic surgery, because I hear this all the time and it, it really bugs me. People say, well, you know, after you got that plastic, they get the plastic surgery. They don't look like, they don't look like themselves anymore. And I'm thinking, I don't look like myself anymore. I put my, I put my 40 year old pic, my 20 year old picture, my 40 year old picture, my 60 some year old picture. Now I don't look a damn thing. Like I used to look like, I don't even know who the hell this is. <laughs> you know? I just see myself on my side and I would seriously look like my German grandmother, which is frightening. I don't look like myself that I used to, you know, I wouldn't care tomorrow if I woke up, if they had a non-surgical, absolute perfect facelift and got rid of all the wrinkles and they can do it. They can, they can make my face longer if they want to. I don't care. If I wake up with a different face, I'm good. <laughs> Cause if I can look, if I can look 30 or 40 again, I wouldn't object. <laughs> no, I'm not too hard on myself, Christina. I'm just, I'm just rational. I'm rational. And, it, and that's the whole thing. It's like, I believe, I believe very strongly in a thing called acceptance. I do. I do. It's because I think when we fight things, that's when, when we can't accept reality, we drive ourselves insane. And that's what depresses people. It's like, oh, I can't believe it. It's like, well, Hey, it is what it is. Go do something else. You know, it's like, you can't, you can't fix certain things. It's just what happened. That's what, just what happens. And then you get up and you figure out what plan of action you can take to, 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 to add something good to your life. And you do that. Um, but you know, it's acceptance and um, I'm not saying you shouldn't try to change things uh, because you can change things, but well, that's the old acceptance and you gotta know what you can't change and change what you can and, and, and not be excessively depressed in the middle of it because that'll keep you from doing anything. You know, you'll just sleep forever. You know, the sleeping is what a lot of de depressed people do, you know, cause, and I do have a problem with that because I'm a real good dreamer. So I find that sometimes during, during coronavirus, 
Man, I had a much better time when I was asleep than when I was awake. I was bored when I was awake. Well, when I went to sleep, I was meeting people. I was going places. <laughs> I was having a great time. And then I wake up and go, ah, crap. <laughs> so I, I can sort of relate to the sleeping. Just keep going back to sleep. And then you can have, you know, this dream world, which is kind of fun, you know. But you don't get a lot accomplished. Oh, <laughs> you have gorgeous. No. And that's probably, it's prop no. It's probably that this is a slightly blurry thing. I do not. I wish I did. I do not. I have, I definitely do not, <laughs> but it's just whatever the camera's doing. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you look great, but you also have substance, which is despite, uh, looks age. Love that you're genuine. Yeah, I know. I'd rather just be me, me. And you know, I'll, I'll tell you something about my sis, my sis, is really it was the really coolest thing about my sister and she said this and it was always so true my sister never wore makeup ever in her life she hated makeup she never wore it never and you know what she said to me she goes you know it's odd that everybody's worried about makeup i never wore makeup i got married i had friends <laughs> i had work and then she ended up divorced at some point she got married to a really nice guy the second time around they're still married 20 years later she's got lots of friends she says i've never noticed i've never had a problem not wearing makeup because i never found it at, you know i tried it a couple times and didn't change my life because i had just as much fun without it and i think there's a lot of truth in that so i think that you know there's people um of all ages who have great times because they have great friends and their friends don't care about these things i mean i don't look i don't think of my friends and go man you you know you should you should get your face done <laughs> you know you need to fix your hair you know you need to wear better clothes I, I don't think that with my friends i i like being with them i like them for the things they who they are and what they do and i don't even think about the fact that you know i don't sit there and care about those things so you know sometimes i think we just put too much emphasis on that not again that we can't try to look our best and look nice and all that. That's all fine. And I enjoy wearing, I, people know I'm, a, I'm an Indian sari freak. I love wearing Indian clothes with gold jewelry, all that. I like it. I do. Um, so I enjoy that. So it's nothing wrong with enjoying what you enjoy, but just not getting obsessed with it to the point that you can't, again, accept certain changes in life. And that's the way they go. And then you just have to kind of shift, <laughs> shift what you enjoy, you know, shift it just a wee bit. Um, <laughs> well, I look in the mirror, what the hell happened to me? <laughs> whoever I was has gone away. <laughs> no, Christine, the two of us, whoever we were, they're hanging out together. <laughs> oh my God. But you know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's like we just just people just need to have a little bit more sense of humor about themselves and a little I, I always think a number of things don't don't ever think anything's ever owed you. It's not nothing. Nobody owes you anything in life that you got a life. You're here and, and you, you got to make what you can make of it. Um, it's up. It's your responsibility. Secondly, you know, don't dwell on the past forever and ever and ever because you can't change it and people weren't perfect. And even if you got a real bad roll of the dice, try not, you know, just say I got a bad roll of the dice. And, and move on from there. It, you know, what happened to you in the past is not who you are unless you make it who you are. So if you know, if you were in a situation where you were raped, once that person is gone, and you know, as long as your body isn't permanently injured, you know, you have, you're still you. I mean, it wasn't a horribly unpleasant experience. That person should be in jail and all that kind of stuff, but you're still you, you know, um, and, and to hang on to that, that you had an unpleasant experience and somebody violated you and hang on to that for 40 years is, 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 is destructive to you, not to the person who did it to you. And if you look and, and understand to yourself, I'm still me, regardless of what that person did. And, you know, then work to, you know, accept that. And, you know, it's not a case of forgetting. It's not a case of forgiving because I'm never big on that. It's just a case of accepting. Um, that's, that's where I think too many people are told that they have to hang on to things and they don't, or they have to, t they have to believe somehow it's damaged themselves so badly that they can't not be damaged anymore. You cannot be damaged by things. You can just go, well, that sucked. And you can move on, you know, by just recognizing it sucked. And you, you, and people say, well, they didn't have the right to do that to you. Well, no, but again, world to you know when you're born into this world you don't get it's not like you have you have the right to have everything perfect 
you know, you have the right to have happiness, love, perfection in your life, and nobody ever, ever do anything bad to you. You don't have that right. You might have that luck, but you don't have that right. You just probably, you're just a human being like the rest of us. And, and sometimes we just have unfortunate things that happen. And what happens to me, what, you know, sometimes, I, well, I've had, the, I've had unfortunate things in my life or things I wish I had. I've seen other people have had. They've had it, I haven't. But then I've had things that they haven't. So, you know, <laughs> you know are we going to do a trade-off or what? I mean, you know, we don't get everything we want in life, but we can get many things we want in life and we can make things happen that make life good and stop being so damn greedy, you know, <laughs> don't be so greedy because, you know, sometimes we just don't get everything. But I find it very sad when I see people commit suicide because I think a lot of times that's the problem is that they, their, their, their expectations and their, their, their belief that things they think they have to be or have to have or have to do are too extreme and um it's funny because sometimes when you're in certain places where the people don't have very much and you know people say they have they're happy when they didn't have have things to some extent there's a truth to that because there's a more peaceful life with lower expect lower expectations and when the expectations get out of control um and uh that's where things become more difficult because i look at i look at situations where people have lived in really bad circumstances um unfortunate homes uh been through war um been a you know had injuries you know been raped in war and things like that and yet they're doing pretty well and you're like wow you're you, they're like well you know i didn't expect much but now i got something decent <laughs> you're like okay that's a good way to look at it you know that you you know you're happy to have gotten through come through that and then you're happy you didn't have your expectations so high that you couldn't achieve things and so i think that's important um to be reasonable you know and you know just be reasonable anyway that's my those were my thoughts on that i just found i always find it sad when i when i see things like that um both on both ends of it you know naomi judd is more my age and the 16 year old you know of course is such young and just starting a life and it's like wow why why you know why do that it's so young and you didn't even, You've done all, well, maybe she just already thinks she's done everything. She doesn't have anything to look forward to, but how sad, you know, just really sad. Anyway, that's it for today. Again, if you're, you're new vi visiting this channel, please do like and subscribe and click the bell so you can find out about more things. Um, and again, we now have, um, you can always join Patreon and join our wonderful chat room with our great people in it. And I'm so glad, Amanda, that you came today for your first time. Yay. Um, and, um, yeah, and so so the next thing I'm going to be doing is going to be the Lynn family murders in uh, Australia. That'll be Friday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. And then I'm going to do, what did I just say, Phil Spector on Sunday. Um, so either 3 or 4 p.m., depending on my granddaughter's uh, soccer game, <laughs> which she's just learning to play. So i got to be there. So. <laughs> so always fun to be here. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. And you're most welcome, Florence. And uh, it's a, always a great time here in the chat room. So I have fun at the hangout. So now I'm going to go eat some, uh, uh, some, I went to a taco truck. I do love a taco truck. <laughs> so I've got taco truck sitting in my kitchen, which I'm going to have for dinner tonight. So I'm so glad you were all here. Hold on, let me, let me get myself together here for the end of the show. <laughs> I've had, this week I've just had this weird problem. I can't seem to manipulate things or remember, or remember names. So, you know, see, I don't have high expectations on my name memory. So I'm like, let me Google that. What's the name? <laughs> and then I just accept that's where it is. You know, that's the way it is. Anyway, I will see you hopefully on Friday. And if you're new here, I hopefully see you in the future. <laughs>